Hi everyone, it's Jackie at Spare Room Studio. Today I'm uh, back to colour in this new book, Goddess Colouring by Anna Jaren. Jaren, not sure of the pronunciation. And again, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. If this is correct, I'm doing Morrigan. The Great Queen Morrigan is a Celtic goddess of death and magic, destiny and war. And when I used to create my own original art, I used to really enjoy um, this as a subject. I used to like um, having a go at creating my own Celtic goddesses. So this is a subject dear to me. And I'm going to use the Sakura Koi watercolours in the pocket field sketch box again. Uh, this is a new book to me, so I don't know whether it's going to cope with the water very well, but we'll see how we go. I'll get started with that. And I also have off to the side Sakura Koi colouring brush pens, and I have various sets of um, the curated six colours, and I've got those off to the side here as well. Um, I also have the 12 set that Secura provided to me as part of their Star of the Month initiative. So uh, they were gifted to me by Secura Australia, as was this watercolour set. So I'm quite enjoying with all things watercolour at the moment, as you probably have guessed if you follow me. Um, or you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that a lot of the pages have had watercolour um, somehow related in most of the pages. I have a little clip here that I'm holding the page open with. Uh, that was actually something that I won as part of a promotion with a company called Moo Boom Planner, I think it was. So that's a great little clip there to keep the book open. And we'll get started. I don't know how far I'm going to get into the colouring today, but I'll try to get as much done as I can. And what I'm planning to do again today is I'm going to lift colours off of the palette, um, like I do with pencils. So I'm going to start up here because it is watercolour, it is best to start furthest away so that you can work down. And I'm going to have a go with, I think this one is Payne's Grey. I'll just grab the box here. Uh, two, three, one is Payne's Grey. So I'm just going to start with the Payne's Grey to do the crows. And I'm going to, again, try to work lightly and without too much water if I can, because I've got a feeling that this particular book is not going to cope with too much water. And I find when I'm doing things like crows or black animals, I like to bring in a little bit of um, other colours so that the black isn't too harsh, so I'm bringing in a little bit of 092 is Viridian Hue, and I'm also bringing in 149, which is Prussian Blue. So I just like to put like a little bit of that sheen of colour so that they don't look too flat. We'll go over to this page, no page, sorry, this bird over here. So I hope that this video finds you all well. Uh, I'm continuing on my recovery from two lots of day surgery in two weeks. Um, been a little bit up and down. So, um, it's been a little bit difficult to sit and record. I also um, don't like to 
come across as a negative Nancy all the time, so I'm conscious that I don't really want to record when I'm not feeling at my best so that it doesn't affect the um, mood um, colouring. So I've been a little bit more quiet this week. I've been colouring a lot on my own though, off, off camera, and I'm really enjoying um, the new book by RJ Hampson. That's been um, nice to just sit in a comfortable chair and, you know, colour it, at, you know, as much and as often as I want to in books like that that give me... Um, a little bit of humour and I can use the bright colours and so on. I do quite enjoy that as a, um, you know, a mood um, picker-upper, I guess. Um, but having said that, this page is going to be quite muted because... Um, We've got the crows, and I'm not sure if this is something that um, is just my interpretation or I've picked up, but I feel like um, the Morrigan should have black hair as well. So um, the colours will be a little bit muted, I think for this one and she is um, what is it they say here the god goddess of death and magic destiny and war so it's a little bit dark um, in terms of subject matter so there will be maybe some little pops of color that we can bring into the wings and her hair and so on but it's going to be quite muted. Now those watercolours are, are going on really nicely on this paper. I don't feel like the paper would cope with a um, heavy soaking. So when I come to do my background, I'm going to have to um, think about that a little bit. But working this way, you're not using a lot of water, so it actually feels quite nice the way that it's going on on the paper. So what I'm doing is I'm actually, um, I've been experimenting with either wetting the paper first like this, and I'm just picking the tiniest bit of colour up on the tip of my brush from the pan, and then using that into the damp damp paper and that's working really nicely so I used it in Christine Karen's wildflower folk and it worked really well on that paper um, I had no problems at all with it on that paper this paper isn't going to cope so well with the amount of water that I normally like to work with. <clears throat> but what I'm enjoying about working with the paints this way is that um, you still get a nice effect with them even if you're not using a lot of water anyway. So I have some paper towel off to the side here that I clean my brush off on and then I'm just going to pick up a little bit more of the um, greens and the blues. And that's where the, the little tiny touches of colour are going to come in. To those birds that are predominantly black. But if you look at um, a crow's wings in the sunlight, there's usually um, flashes of colour that you see. So... We can lift the colours a little bit by using those. 
So if I'm not wetting the paper first, what I'm doing is just with the water brush, the water that's naturally coming out of that brush, I'm not squeezing it. And um, just again, the tiniest touch of the watercolour pan, you can see that I'm getting a decent amount of colour there and I'm still able to blend that out on the paper. This paper is quite smooth. So it is actually allowing me to blend that paper, uh, sorry, paint out on the paper without thoroughly um, soaking it. So that's um, interesting. And being a Celtic goddess, I tend to think of green. It's a bit cliche, but you know, Ireland and greenness. So that will all need to dry, obviously, but we're going to get started on her hair. I'm going to try not to make this too long a video, if we can. So again, I'm still using the Payne's Grey. The Payne's Grey has a slightly um, bluish look to it to my mind so when I don't want to use a solid black Payne's Grey is a really good alternative for a dark and what I will do is at the end just use black or I can bring in a little bit here now this is ivory black and I can put little bits in there, but I still feel like um, with watercolour, too much black um, deadens any page, I feel. But especially with watercolour, it's good to have a light touch and only use it in, you know, a few few places to get the most impact with it. And that's very much a personal uh, opinion and preference, of course. So some areas I'm leaving the paint a little bit less diluted, so um, the colour is a bit deeper. But I'm still not trying to cover up those lines, you know, the um, colouring book lines. I want all of that to show through. So I don't want my uh, watercolours to be too dark. Again, that's um, a bit of a personal preference. Everyone has their, um, their likes and dislikes when it comes to um, colours and painting styles and so on but I really feel like I should attempt to make watercolours light. If it's not working for me I can always come back later and deepen up the colours or I can indeed come back with coloured pencil and do coloured pencil over the top if that's what I deem necessary but to start with with the watercolour I try to um, work in a way that I intend to only use watercolours I don't plan to come in with pencil and then if something doesn't work then that's when I will use the pencil or make it into a mixed media piece but Usually when I work with watercolours, I try to make the watercolour just um, the goal, you know, to be purely a watercolour piece. Especially with these paints. But I think it might be nice to bring in, uh, you know, these colouring brush pens for some details and, and strengthening up some colours. And because they're water-based, I'm hoping that it will work nicely with the 
watercolour and not obliterate the watercolour too much. When you're colouring a page and basing a page with a um, particular medium, sometimes you do want it to just be um, a base. And I'm thinking about um, if you've ever watched Dee Dee Willingham, um, she uses acrylic paint washes and then almost completely covers them up with coloured pencils sometimes. Sometimes she, she leaves the acrylic showing, um, but you know, she does that to speed up the process and give the paper um, a, a good base for the colour pencil to grip to. But other times you really don't um, necessarily need to completely cover that base. Because I, I sometimes feel like with um, alcohol markers, if I've spent the time doing a nice alcohol marker base, I should really only need a little bit of pencil just to enhance areas. I, sh I shouldn't really need to obliterate everything by going over it in pencil. So I'm just moving back and forward between the Payne's Grey, the Prussian Blue and a little touch of the Viridian Hue. I think what we could do is we could bring in a pop of colour with her outfit behind there, that would be nice. And I think what I might do is um, bring in a lighter green. This one is 114. It's permanent green pale. And I'm just going to put a little bit of that into this background. Yeah, I think I'm going to <coughs> Pardon me, sneeze. That snuck up rather suddenly. It's very windy here today and we're supposed to still be in winter but we've got a high of 24 degrees Celsius which is not winter weather and it's very windy so I feel like um, there might be a bit of pollen in the air being blown about here where I live we get north winds and the north winds seem to bring down all the pollens from the areas where they're growing um, wheat and canola and different crops, you know, cereal crops and so on. And um, when the north winds blow, it seems to be the worst time for anyone that suffers with hay fever. And I feel like that might be what's happening today. So that little pop of green lifts it a little bit as well. And I'm not using it really, really heavily. I'm touching the paintbrush to the pan and then putting it onto the dry paper. And then as I'm working away from that initial bit, you can see how much it's diluting it. And that's just the water that's coming out of the um, water brush. It's not soaking the paper. And what I'm liking about that is it's really letting that white of the paper shine through and that color's looking really nice and vibrant. I said that I'd like to keep this all watercolour, but I know that it's going to be difficult to get the look that I want on the Celtic knot there. So I think I will probably be bringing in those colouring brush pens 
at some stage. And luckily not using too much water like this means that the um, paint is actually drying rather quick. There's a lot of detail here that can be a bit tricky for picking what's going on between the knots and what's here behind her fingers. It can be a bit tricky. And I think for her outfit, I was thinking of doing it in the deep green, but we can maybe put a little flash of that in the wings there too. I was thinking deep green, but, hmm. A gold or an orange maybe or a purple maybe purple so I might try purple violet to start with it's a bit hard to tell what's going on here with this outfit So at this stage, I haven't mixed any of the colours either. This is um, the colours that are coming off of the palette in their pure form. They're not being mixed with any other colour. You may have seen my uh, recent video where I used... Yeah, so that's really tricky to know where that is going isn't it in my recent video where I use these watercolors I talk about um, not muddying your colors and how it can quickly turn into mud if you use too many colors either on the page or mixing them So it's a bit of an um, art in itself to mix the colours with watercolour because it you can make things look very dull and murky very quickly if you're not careful. And I'm finding it difficult here to work out what some of these areas are. So I'm just going to make that all a part of her robes. Yeah, it's a bit a bit difficult to tell what's going on with some of these these areas. I haven't really seen too many pages coloured into the coloured out of this book just yet. Um, on Instagram, it's a really lovely book. I'm just going to use a little bit of ultramarine deep now to make that a little bit more purple. I'm sort of thinking about that, you know, that write up that magic and war and death and It feels like it maybe purple would be a suitable colour for her robes.
And we could even put a touch of that ultramarine into some of these birds' wings as well. Okay, I'm going to use uh, yellow ochre for basing the skin. And when I put colour on that's too vibrant like that, I just use a clean, damp brush and I just brush some of that colour back off again and then I'm wiping it onto the paper towel. Now she could either be very tanned, being that she's, you know, a bit of a warrior goddess. Maybe she's out in the open, in the elements, or the fact that she's a Celtic goddess, she could have very, very pale skin. So I don't want to, I don't want to go too dark too soon before I decide what I'm going to do with her there. I'm going to use a little bit of, this is cadmium red hue to put a bit of colour into her lips. And I'll come back and um, put some shading on there. This is crimson lake that I'll put a bit of colour into her cheeks. And again, I'm putting a bit of Crimson Lake here on a lower lip just to darken that a little bit. And this is the Purple Violet. I'm going to use that to shadow her eyes. And a little bit for the shadow under here. And that's too vibrant, so I'm just pushing that back, diluting it with the water brush. There we go. I'm still on camera here. So again, you know, if I feel like I to put too much colour on, I just use that damp brush just to lift a bit of that back off again. use a little touch of the burnt umber just to knock back some of the yellowness of that um, yellow ochre and I can see here where I've used a bit more water it's um, made the paper look spotty so I'm guessing it's not going to cope very well with too much water at all. And it's definitely going to be some gold being used in here. So I think the outer ring of the knot here, I'm going to use the 
that are already in here. Now, if you're not very confident with a brush, you'd find something like this could be a bit tricky. Um, I'm also not too fussed because I'm going to come back, I think, with some gold on there. Um, it's not the end of the world if I get a little bit over onto those um, twisting knots. because I think I'll put gold on there. Gold or silver, I'm not sure. Again, as the painting or drawing goes on, you know, you start to make some of those decisions differently. You, you might have an idea to start with. And then once you see it come together, you might think, um, no, that wasn't, wasn't really the right choice. So, gold I'm thinking because of its um, ability to really lift the page with the colour, but because she's the goddess of war and magic and death and so on, I'm actually thinking that silver might be more appropriate. I do have um, some other metallic colours to choose from because I do have the set of um, Secura metallic jelly rolls that um, I think there's about 12 colours in that set. So I do have some other choices that I could go with there as well. So when you're working with water media, it's a good idea if you do try to do all of your um, your your order of working, sorry, from top to bottom, and if you're right-handed, um, from left to right, and if you're left-handed, then right to left and top to bottom because it just means that your hand's not constantly working over those wet areas. By the time you get to the bottom, you know, if, if you're not using too much water, by the time you've got to the bottom of the page, the top will have started to dry off a little bit. And that might seem um, an obvious thing to say, but I've been drawing and painting for some time and I still end up going in the wrong order and just, you know, picking an area that I think, oh, that looks nice to colour, I'll do that. And then I've got to wait for it to dry because I've started in an awkward place. So I do still do it myself. Ordinarily, when I'm, I'm, you know, working on my own, it doesn't really matter because I can just, you know, use the hair dryer or wait for it to dry or whatever. But being on camera is a little bit different because I don't want to put that noisy hair dryer on and uh, blow your eardrums out. I've been thinking about whether I should invest in a heat gun because I think they give the um, more heat but they're also not blowing the air about so much I don't think so I'm wondering whether they actually do work better or quicker for drying off work so if anybody uses a heat gun you know let me know how you find it. So my aim here is not to have a solid um, 
solid area of colour. Um, I'm not attempting to try and portray that it's enamel or you know paint or anything like that. It's just purely a decorative um, illustration. So I like to see variation in the colours in watercolour. So darker and lighter areas um, and some different effects. I don't necessarily need it to be like block saturated colouring when it's watercolour. I like to see the variation in the lights and darks and so on. So I'm not trying to actually get that even. And I might also use that, that colour. Well, I've got permanent green deep here. I'll use a darker green on this. A bit here on her robes or cloak. So I can tell, tell already that it is cockling the, pa the paper quite a bit up the top there with the water that I used. So that's worth knowing if you're going to work with water in this book. You know, the back of the page has got the writing for the next goddess. So it doesn't really matter if you go, you know, unless you really want to read it um, and you're going to use alcohol marker or something that's going to obliterate it. Um, it doesn't matter if there's a bit of bleed through on there, but I'm thinking it might be worth actually having a go with the iron on this, this one when I'm finished to flatten it out. So I'm giving her green eyes. Now sometimes I never know whether to treat this as a brooch that there's something in the middle there that's different, but I know with the robes they used to have those um, rings with the pin through them didn't they so that's what we're going to imply there we're going to I think we'll use gold on there for sure mm, yeah still still on the fence there with that um, now we've got a couple of eels down here I'm going to do them we've got olive green And I'm going to use that with a combination of the other greens off of the page. I think eels are quite um, muted in colour, aren't they, in real life? But I feel like that would make the picture a little bit boring. So I'm going to use a combination of the olive green and the other greens that I've got and I'm also bringing in a bit of burnt umber there as well. A little bit of olive green back down there. Okay. So you can see, um, unless you're going to go over with lots and lots of layers over and over and over, um, these watercolour pages can be quite fast. If you're not soaking them too much, they actually can be rather quick. So 
So that's a bit of Payne's Grey with the dark green, which was called Permanent Green Deep, that I've done on the head there. There are ways to imply that um, an animal or bird is black without actually using too much black. So I've actually, this is black what I'm using here now. So I want you to see what the difference is when you only just do a few little pops of that black to give it more impact. too solidly and to me that is just um, gone over her face a bit there which doesn't help it's a bit dead so I'm just lifting some of that back off again and I've actually got some of that on her face there which is not what I want it's not ideal but we'll fix it up later Now obviously if I was doing a lifelike portrait I'd be a lot more careful with where I'm putting colours in her hair if I wanted it to actually look like it was real but um, this is quite a stylized illustration without being too realistic so I'm not going to worry about doing a totally realistic rendering of her hair so that's the ultramarine sorry no it's not it's the prussian blue with the Payne's grey that i'm doing with that and this is the ultramarine so you can see if I just used the black her hair would have been pretty lifeless um, but adding in the highlights with the ultramarine and the Prussian blue and so on, um, still, you know, you still get that impression she's got black hair, but it's not so bland and lacking in light. Well, hopefully that's what's coming across anyway. So again, I'm barely touching the paint palette there with the tip of the brush. There's very little colour going on there. And we'll just do that up here for the where the light will be hitting her hair. And yeah, the paper is cockling quite a bit up there. So what I will do now, just to give you something different to look at, um, I'm going to use the um, metallic uh, jelly roll metallics. And I think that 
gold will lift it for her jewellery. And I'm normally not a big fan of using too much uh, gel pen. on a page, but um, you know, she's a Celtic goddess and the Celts were known for having all that gold talks and brooches and so on. So we'll do some gold there. And I'm actually going to do this gold as well. I do have some gold, um, metallic gold watercolours, but this is quite fiddly and quite detailed and I don't think with I'd get in there very well with the small brush. So when you want that control, it is easier just to use a pen sometimes. And the Secura Gold is one of my favourites. I've got um, a few of them now. I bought a few that were open stock for spares as well. So I quite like the gold and the silver in the Secura Jelly Roll. And this um, black is very handy too because it's not overly black, it's more like a pewter. So those bits of shadow areas there, I'm just going to do with that. And Perhaps instead of doing it all with watercolour, I might use I've got um, deep yellow and yellow. So to start with, I might just use these, get the colour down quickly. So instead of using gold on all of that, what I'll do is just use the yellow to get started. So I'm using the deep yellow here in the bits where it's overlapped and then using the yellow just to tease that colour out and blend it so that it doesn't stop set suddenly. seems to be underneath her finger there. Still not 100% sure what's going on behind there. So that's a start with that. I could also bring in 
Uh, let's have a look. A little bit of raw umber. Just in a few bits to imply like a a tarnished look maybe or just that it's shadowed. I don't think I want it everywhere. And um, what could we do with the birds maybe? What are we at? 51 minutes? I might actually use that what to do with that might use this metallic here lighter colour oh, I just managed to smudge there what a nuisance and I'm dropping things Okay, um, just having a little think about the background. In for a penny, in for a pound, I am going to do my usual washy background up there. And I'm going to use a combination of these colours, I think. I'm going to wet that a little bit, get the ultramarine first and of course because it's not great paper for watercolour I'm not going to get all the true bleeding and blending that I normally like. I'll be surprised if I manage to achieve that. I'm using a, a quite a bit more colour than I have so far but that's because I'm dropping it into a very wet area So I, I do definitely prefer to drop it into the wet paper. I think the results of that is better than 
onto dry paper because I very much do enjoy the wet in wet uh, techniques of blending colour. You might be able to hear my rubbish truck coming up the street. So where the paper has started to crinkle and buckle, it's um, not laying flat. So those colours are going wherever they want. Not by my doing, but by the fact that the paper is buckled. Get some lovely um, subtle wash effects with these paints. They are nice. might just sort of fade that back down to here I don't know that really it needs to be all the way down to the bottom we'll see how it looks and then adjust it as we go So it might be better if I get the iron onto this page because it is starting to really curl up. And I've gone right out to there. So that might be going underneath on the other page, I'm not sure. See how that dries and I might do a little bit out here So I started off quite light, but then once I know what colour I'm really liking, that's where I've got a little bit more bold with the, the colour choice. Okay, so I've really got to let that dry now. That's about an hour. I think I'll come back and finish this for you in a part two. I'm really starting to question my choices down here now with that up there, but we'll see. I might need to darken all of this. Okay, so thank you for watching and I will be back with part two if you're interested in seeing how I finish this page. Bye now.